Hello everyone, I'm Asim Jakar, founder of uh, Exploity, and today we are going to be talking about EV charger security. And I have with me Thais Alkamare, security researcher at uh, Computer Sector 7. So let's start with uh, talking about your latest research and uh, what were your findings from the on to on challenge on EV chargers. Yeah, so earlier this year in January, we participated in a new edition of Pwn to own uh, This one's focused on uh, automotive. So there were various targets like Tesla in the vehicle category. They had infotainment systems, they had automotive operating systems. But the one that we had the most success with was on EV chargers. We didn't really expect this at first, but they turned out to be uh, the most interesting for us. So in the end, we had exploits for vulnerabilities in three different brands of EV chargers, the Juicebox 40, the Autel Maxi charger, and the ChargePoint Home Flex. And all three of them, yeah, we could get arbitrary code running on the charger, uh, sometimes by being on the same Wi-Fi network, sometimes we're just connecting over Bluetooth. Then the charger, we can just do anything we want with it uh, because you have control over it. Can can you give us more details about the specific uh, attacks and vulnerabilities that you identified? Autel, for example, we found that if you connect over Bluetooth, there's normally some authentication procedure, but there was a backdoor in there. So with just a specific token from the, uh, from the firmware, we could set up an authenticated connection, even though we, it wasn't our charger. And then after that, we found a stack buffer overflow that we could exploit to get arbitrary code execution. And then the juice box had a lot of functionality available, a lot of commands. We found a way to turn log messages into a way that would also overflow stack buffer. So again, stack buffer overflow. And then the charge point, we actually had two different vulnerabilities there that we could use. The first one was there was a command injection when you provision the device. So you need to give it the Wi-Fi credentials and you do this over Bluetooth. There's a command injection in the Wi-Fi SSID. Um, yeah, and there's also no authentication on Bluetooth. So you just connect to the charger, just one payload and you have arbitrary code running. But a lot of other teams had this one as well. So very last minute, we found another exp uh, vulnerability that we exploited by intercepting the OCPP connection to the cloud. We could bypass the certificate check and then uh, get code execution. Oh, nice. So these, uh, the Bluetooth vulnerabilities that you mentioned, uh, uh, you mentioned you found a classic buffer flow as well. Was it in the Bluetooth, Bluetooth parsing or was it some other module handling the Bluetooth commands. So it was in the actual main controller, which has a different chip handling Bluetooth. But once a message gets in, it's being parsed. And then once it gets a very specific type of message, there was a place where it just copies it into a fixed size stack buffer. So it was not on the Bluetooth chip itself, but actually on the, the main controller. Ah, okay. Okay. And, uh, and and the commands that you mentioned on Jukebox, the, uh, the, the, the second, were these also over Bluetooth? No, for the Jukebox, we attacked it over Wi-Fi. We did have a way that we could do it with just Bluetooth, with just being in Bluetooth range but it had a bit more steps involved so during the competition we want to keep everything simple and reliable so they yeah, we just decided to be on the same wi-fi network but we probably could have done it just with bluetooth hmm. interesting so when you're looking at ev chargers is there a set of different technologies like you mentioned ocpp are there any other protocols or tech stacks that you need to look at from a security perspective of uh, EV charging infrastructure as a whole? I think OCPP is yeah, the main one you see there. And for us, it, it just looks like stuff we know a lot of. So it's, it's just WebSocket messages uh, with JSON. So lots of websites use stuff similar to this. So it wasn't like we had to learn a completely new standard for us. It was just yeah stuff we already really knew. And other than that, I don't think there was a lot of things that were very charger specific. Of course, there's IoT specific things like Bluetooth for provisioning and how do you really handle uh, registering a device, but that's not really specific to an EV charger. So do you see code execution vulnerabilities or memory corruption vulnerabilities more prevalent in IoT devices than you know your typical you know, servers or laptops? Yeah, these bugs that we found were pretty shallow, so we didn't have to look very long to, to find these vulnerabilities. So I definitely think they are more common on the uh, IoT devices than in applications and uh, on normal desktops or, or servers. I think that's mainly just because it's a lot harder to get the firmware, so much fewer people actually look at it uh, because for many of the chargers actually getting the firmware first was more challenging than, than finding the bugs. 
So not many people look at this, so many of these vulnerabilities never get found. Or the vendors just think, well, we make it hard to get the firmware, so we don't need to solve all of the vulnerabilities. Probably also happens. Yeah, it definitely looks like there's a, a lot more of these vulnerabilities here. I mean, spending more time on making sure that you can't get the firmware versus just, you know, training your developers to write secure code would be, you know, in my opinion, would be more simple. Yeah, but it's also like a sign of trust in your own code if you make your firmware publicly available, like everybody can look at this. So Windows or iOS, everybody can decompile this. That's, that's not being obfuscated at all. Seeing all of these devices that go to all of these weird obfuscation steps to make sure nobody gets firmware. I think that's just making those companies look bad compared to uh, those who do make this information public. All right. So finally, for uh, you know, for researchers out there who are learning as well as you know trying to find vulnerabilities either in embedded IoT products or EV chargers specifically, do you have any advice in terms of okay, you should probably follow this process when you are looking for bugs or doing bug hunting. So getting the firmware is, of course, essential. you testing st things blindly, that's probably not going to work. So you want to get firmware, you want to get some kind of debug information from when the application is running, like the UART logs uh, on many of these devices were just full of useful information for us. Yeah, and then you can start looking. And for most of these, it was really just as simple as finding the mem copy calls and going over through over them one by one and that was typically enough. The targets we didn't have much success with are also often the targets where we couldn't get the firmware. So required more hardware work. So that's definitely the place where, where you want to start. So, so I'm getting a sense that when you're looking at a particular device, the first thing that you would want to do is start from hardware recon and then identify ways in, to get into and try and extract either you know, extract it from memory or through the debug ports, wherever. But yeah. that's the first step that you need to. Yeah, or find some storage that you can easily detach and dump or, yeah, some kind of update procedure over the internet where it downloads a new file. Thank you for joining us, guys. Thanks it was a pleasure it. to have you.